Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Taha Arvas, and welcome to TRT World Forum's uh, The Disillusion of the American Dream, COVID-19, and the Politics of Healthcare. Today, we'll be discussing exactly that, uh, what we have witnessed in the last few months and how this has um, resulted in uh, disillusionment uh, regarding American, the American healthcare system and, frankly, uh, the, the larger global healthcare system uh, altogether. So, um, uh, I just want to say a few words and then we'll begin our discussion and we'll uh, bring our discussants in. Or should we just, we, we, uh, there, does everyone see me? I can see everyone else. Can, that, can everyone else see me? Wave of hands if you can see me and hear me, people. Yes, I see Daria Bay. There we go. Okay, people can see me. Great. So um, let me just make a, a quick introduction um, and we can start if you'd like. We'll have half an hour for everyone to. Uh, uh, jump in, talk about what they think about the topic, and then we'll go into an hour worth of a discussion period. Um, if you'd like, uh, just in short, uh, I just want to say that obviously um, this has been a time for all of us uh, that's been very interesting for those of us who, um, uh, and Mr. Shepard is there. Hi, Mr. Shepard. Just waiting on you. Perfect. Great. You're here. So I think we can we can go ahead um, and begin the discussion if you'd like. Uh, Essentially, it's. I'll chime in later. I'll let you guys go first. Uh, maybe we can start with um, Mr. Falk. I, I'm just doing it in, in the order I see here. Mr. Falk, can you hear me and see me? Would you like to begin and start off the yes, discussion? Yes. I, 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 I don't see you, but I hear you. I guess that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm very. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, roundtable on the with an intriguing title. I'm not a health expert, and so I will try to, in the time available to me, talk about uh, the, the larger issues that have been presented by the COVID uh, challenge. And uh, I will talk about four main uh, effects that it seems to have had. Uh, the first and most obvious effect is the exposure of systematic racism in the United States as a consequence of uh, a disease which has disproportionately uh, harmed those who are people of color, people who live in poor neighborhoods, and generally people who are more vulnerable in the society. So it has exposed uh, the deep uh, kind of socio socioeconomic inequality uh, that accounts for many of the internal tensions that we experience within the United States. Uh, and there's a second uh, broad uh, impact, and, and that impact is on the degree to which those federal, of course, the United States is a country of 50 uh, state jurisdictions, and each state has its own governance uh, system that is predominant in a health uh, context, and has been particularly so under the leadership of Donald Trump. And what we have seen is that those red states, the Republican states, have suffered much more severely from the COVID crisis than have the blue states, the Democratic states, which follow the guidelines of the uh, Center for Disease Control, Dr. Fauci, and generally uh, pursue a uh, science-based approach to uh, health and uh, social policy. And so one of the things that's most evident here is this, uh, what it means to live in a post-truth society under the kind of stress that has been generated uh, by the COVID pandemic. The second uh, aspect of the overall situation that I would call attention to is that 
this pandemic as climate change before it has called uh, attention to the need for global problem solving in relation to uh, the most important issues facing humanity. And at the very point where uh, American leadership, which had existed since the end of World War II, uh, and had emphasized uh, this kind of global cooperative approach to problem solving, uh, as recently as the Obama uh, presidency, at the very moment when we need it most to deal with uh, the health issues, uh, it has been repudiated, not only not acted upon in a responsible fashion, but actually repudiated. And this has been tangibly expressed by the US withdrawal from H WHO and the defunding of this crucial health coordinating unit of the UN, and also by blocking UN Security Council initiatives that were calling for a greater effort at global cooperation and dealing in a responsible way with countries that are most under challenge and least evident, least capable of addressing them. The third uh, uh, point that I want to emphasize is that the U.S. suffers from a, the aftermath of the Cold War, and it suffers from it in a manner relevant here by, a, by decades of overinvestment in a military approach to international relations and a under uh, investment in diplomacy and peaceful means of problem solving. And this has expressed itself ideologically in a hostility to governmental control of health policy. And you have this Trump reaction to any kind of uh, acknowledgement that the state has a positive role to play at a time of crisis like this. In other words, there's an ideological regression that uh, disempowers the state, the federal state, to act responsibly under present conditions. Fourth and finally is the impact of the recent U.S. elections, which I think are positive in the sense of uh, repudiating the kind of uh, dysfunctional leadership provided by Donald Trump, but it has not removed the element of Trumpism and autocratic repudiation of a uh, science-based ah, rational society. And therefore, it gives us back civility and a re-entry into the world of global leadership, but without any assurance that the Biden presidency will not lead toward a new kind of geopolitical confrontation uh, with China, a new Cold War in effect. So we are multiply challenged at this time and hopefully we can find some creative responses. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rachel, we appreciate that. Uh, I think the last statement might, may have been a, an understatement and will be challenging for the next US president to address. Um, I'd like to go on to Blair Shepard. Uh, if, uh, thank you for your comments. Maybe we'll take questions at the end, obviously, after we go uh, ahead. Mr. Shepard, if you're if you're available, uh, please you can you can go ahead. Great, thank you, and uh, apologies for the technology issues. Um, 
So, so just two qualifiers okay. before I begin, if I can. Uh, first, first one is, um, if I take the title of the conference, I'm actually an immigrant to the United States who's been pretty successful. And so I'm actually uh, a believer in the American dream. Um, and and uh, the second is that um, while the, the conversations about the WHO, they're a client of PwC. And so um, I'll speak to multilateral institutions at large and let you just determine whether or not you think they apply to WHO in particular. So, so I think the important point is that um, as you think about multilateralism, there's kind of a prima facie case it isn't working, right? Um, and, and, and so just think about it uh, in terms of the global issues. And, and, and Professor Falk talked about several of them. One of them is that um, disparity is growing at an accelerated pace, not just between individuals, but between regions and actually places within nation states and, and across generations, actually. Technology is having uh, massive impacts on, on, on the quality of life, and, and we're not navigating them well, um, in, including, for example, the implications of the industrial system on what's happening to climate. Um, there's declining trust in institutions at a scary accelerated rate, um, both within countries and between countries. Um, and and uh, we, we, it's not clear we have the leaders we need to actually address it, that, that people are not stepping up and actually taking care of these issues in the way we need. And then finally, you can just sort of see the very, very varied response to COVID and that crisis as an illustration that just the institutions aren't working. The worry I have in part that I think is really critical about this conversation is institutions are for people what fish, what water is to fish. So if we don't trust the legal system, if we don't trust the education system, we don't trust the political system, we don't trust multilaterals, we actually just can't get on in life. And the result is um, it, it's, it's hard to progress forward. And so I think this is a really important set of questions that we have to address pretty, um, pretty urgently. So you can pose the question, why is this the case? Right. And, and there's a lot of there's a lot of really important pieces, but I'll highlight four. Um, so the first one is that institutions are by themselves designed to change slowly. Right. So having grown up in a university, every time we tried to change the curriculum, it would take years to have that change. And the reason is that we need institutions to be stable and predictable. Um, and the reason we need to be stable and predictable is actually we can't get on with life if we don't know how they're going to behave. That very quality, though, is actually a, is, is a problem in highly disruptive times because institutions do not adapt to the speed at which the world needs them to adapt. And so we actually have a misfit between kind of the ideal characteristic of an institution, which is to adapt slowly, and the needs we have in a world which is massively disruptive, right? The second is actually many of our institutions were designed for a world that was sort of single-minded and the world is increasingly fractured. Right? Um, think about multilateral institutions. There were kind of two ideal states at the time of Bretton Woods. Um, and, and if you were either in one camp or in the other, and, and so there was kind of an agreement on what, what a, a nation state should look like and what a political economy should look like. What we actually have today is massive change um, and, and massive variability around the world in terms of the nature of political economy. Uh, un, unlike sort of the view that history is over, history's gotten really interesting. And I think actually for the good, because we need experimentation to happen in the world. So we continue to evolve better and better and better uh, political economic models. But the, the challenge is we actually now have institutions that are trying to manage in a, where they have a singular mindset, where there's a radically different point of view about how the world should operate, and therefore different preference functions, different objectives, different ways of proceeding. The third is a kind of a, just, a, just a natural characteristic of institutions, which is they are increasingly off mission. And that happens for one of two reasons. They start with a core mission and then they just they just add to it because they're successful in their core mission. Sort of it's the it's the cost of continued success. Um, but the second one is actually because there are many constituents that hold the institution to account. What occurs is they say, could you just do this one thing for me? Now, for many multilaterals, the problem is they have pretty limited budgets. And so they take a significant portion of the budget and allocate it to something which is not central to its core it's highly distractive. And so it's really worth instructive to just go look at the budgets within any one of the multilaterals and see how many of them are on core mission, how many are on really important things, but not central to their function. 
And I think the final one is that actually we have leaders designed for the 20th century and we live in the 21st century. Right. And, and, and so at some level, we need institutions to be led by people who recognize the challenges I just described. Now, there are more than that, many, many more than that. But what I want to highlight is that those four are kind of unique to the times we live in today and therefore the ones we have to particularly address. So what do we do about them? Right. Um, the first thing I think is we have to trim down the objective for every institution and go back to its core and remember it and then innovate like crazy around it. Um, so if it's a university, you've got to go back and say, why are we really here? And then let's make sure we, 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 we retain that and work around it. If it's a, if it's a WHO, why are we here? Let's be sure that we're only working on that and then and organize around it. And, and, and the reason in part is related to a little bit the fractured world issue and, and what Professor Falk described, which is there are a few things we can probably all agree on and, and if we focus on the things we can all agree on, we begin to bring people together who otherwise won't be brought together with each other. Right? And so I think most of us can agree on a few things. And in any of the multilaterals, there's one or two things we can agree on. Let's get there, let's work on them, and let's, and let's adapt the system faster. Second, I think we need to design the institutions for a fractured world. We have to start with the assumption that actually the parties to the conversation come with a different view about how a political economy should operate and how society should operate and treat that as a bonus, as a good thing, and therefore actually create solutions that are adaptive to very varied context rather than imposing one from the center. The third is that I think we have to connect to community more. Um, that in some ways, one of the challenges with multilaterals and globalization broadly is it's been disparate in its impact. Right. And, and so some places have really, really benefited, others haven't. And, and so, so the challenge is we have to kind of go back and say, it doesn't make sense to have a global world unless we are thriving local societies first. Now, that's very different from Turkey first, America first, Israel first. It's actually about local first, in a sense. You, you, you can't build a thriving global world without thriving local economies, and we need all as many economies as we can to thrive. A way to think of it is we need geographic inclusiveness as a design consideration for the, for the institutions we're building. Um, and, and therefore, that means we have to connect to the local institution, local community, because they have very different issues, very different challenges. And, and, and a multilateral that imposes a single worldview is just going to fail in dealing with the tapestry the world's composed of. Fourth, I think we need to find expedited governance structures that allow faster adaptation, but don't lose the reason why we had governance in the first place. So, so the chance if you go back to the point I was raising that institutions are designed to slow to change slowly, let's find a way to govern them to allow faster adaptation, but not lose the central characteristics of why we had the governance in the first place and and, and agree with each other that speed matters. Um, fifth is we need to develop the leaders that are essential to run this. And I think the key piece in that is they have to be able to reconcile paradox. They have to be able to be extremely humble, but, but have the courage to take decisions at the same time, technologically capable, but humanists at the same time. And then the final point I think is we have, I'd like us to learn one of the lessons that came out of COVID, which is the world can do things massively and fast if we agree on the problem. So if I had offered you a bet and said, I'll offer you a thousand rubles um, at a thousand one odds, um, and you take the side that the world will shut down its economy overnight, you take the side that the world will shut down its economy, won't shut down its economy overnight, I'll take the side that it will, you'd have taken that bet and you'd have lost. If I had said, um, we would we would create a vaccine at the accelerated rate we would, most of you would have denied that. But I think what we've learned is that actually we can do things massively and quickly when we agree on the central problem, we organize our resources around it. And, and, uh, and to me, there's a real lesson from the difference between what happened with COVID and what happened with the vaccine. We protected the core institution, which is the regulatory review process and, and the clinical design process, 
But then we had massive ideas about how to change it around it, which is let's run five or six trials simultaneously. Let's manufacture before the drug is produced. Let's actually try different strategies concurrently rather than sequentially. And, and so let's, let's but, but we never gave up the regulatory regime that ensured that it was actually a good product when it was finished. That's a great example of remember your core mission and, and, and innovate around it. I think if we could agree on the very few things that the world agrees on and go take it on, one of the obvious ones being climate, and we went after it massively and quickly, and we acknowledge the other points I described, we could begin to repair the ills of multilateral institutions. And thank you. Thank you, Dean Shepard. Professor Falk, thank you. Um, we, we can go on to our next uh, speaker for now. If we have any questions, everyone, please hold your questions till uh, the end of the speakers. And then in the discussion session, we will address them. And I'll come back with some comments as well. Uh, Dr. Yarabuk, and if you can please start your discussion and your, excuse me, your comments, that would be uh, much appreciated. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll be taking a picture. And in light of uh, comments of uh, Mr. Shepard, there will be examples of what just happened in the United States and in the world. So the pandemic is a test and especially a lot of countries are failing it right now. The failures have been most obvious in America because probably the Trump administration didn't come up with a detailed plan for how they will deal with the COVID-19 pandemic at first. By the time President Donald Trump strode into the White House briefing room on the evening of February 26, the virus had already killed more than 2,500 people in China and forced the lockdown of 11 million uh, residents in Wuhan. And infections in Italy were rising by an astonishing 40% every single day. That night, Trump assured Americans, we are ready, he said, and uh, he said that we are very, very ready for anything and everything. Then he held a report in his hand, uh, which was co-produced by Johns Hopkins Center uh, for Health Security, ranking 195 countries on their readiness to confront a pandemic. And he said that the United States is rated number one, the most prepared. But in fact, actually, as we see right now clearly in the world, that no country was uh, clearly ready for such kind of an outbreak. And collectively, international pre preparedness was also weak. No one was thinking about such I kind of uh, virus uh, but, but going over and over again. So moreover, the index revealed a number of US laws that have proved crippling in the fight against COVID-19. America, can, can you guys hear me? I mean, Mr. Falk couldn't hear, I-, I, I Professor Falk, did, did you? Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm back. Okay. I uh, somehow I had a technical problem. Okay, no problem. So okay. America received the lowest possible score for public confidence in government low rankings among the index of 60 high-income countries for doctors per capita and hospital beds per capita. But the tragic one was dismal rating for access to healthcare, which was, they were 175th out of 195 countries. And now more than 10 million people in the U.S. have been infected with COVID-19 and recently daily infections have reached peak numbers and have led to at least 250,000 deaths by now and White House predictions uh, are calculated to be 500K by the spring of 2021, which is uh, massive. This is uh, the more Deaths, rate is it that to the 500 deaths, Dr. Dr. Erbakan? We all talk about uh, by now, yes. I'm sorry, did you say the 500,000 deaths by spring 2021? I just wanted to, make, to clarify that. Yes, five, 500,000 uh, deaths uh, are predicted. Uh, by 2021 spring. And this is the mortality rate similar to okay. the 1918 Spanish flu, which was about 2.5%. But the coronavirus crisis hit the world a century after this flu, when the time when humanity has significant healthcare and technology advances and so on. But the World Health Organization, meanwhile, for months now, has been making an empathy plea to countries around the world saying that social distancing is crucial to stop the spread of coronavirus, but it is only half the equation. To suppress and control a pandemic of this magnitude, countries also might find and isolate every person and so on. A string of failures at the White House, CDC, and FDA have led to intractable delays in making diagnostic tests for COVID-19 widely available in the United States. So we came late. We couldn't use our resources, just like Mr. Shepard has 
uh, told in a speech. Worst of all, widespread testing has been disastrously slow to come online in the United States and presidency have repeatedly assured that the country, they will do so. But when calendars showed March, they have declared state of emergency, but unfortunately COVID spread was out of control by that time. In mid-May, they did something good and the federal government launched Operation Warp Speed, a critical joint effort by the CDC, FDA, and the federal agencies to accelerate the development, testing, and approval of a vaccine, which the process often takes 10 to 15 years. Normally, they wanted to shorten this to one, one year, one and a half years, and so on. This was almost the best thing they have ever done, and it gave guidance to other countries as well, including Turkey, including other countries as well. So meanwhile, they did not pursue a universal treatment plan in treating the ones were infected, that was the flaw. The U.S. government set a goal of getting 300 million doses of a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine to Americans by the January 2, 2021, with the presidential campaign well underway, the arrival date for, for a vaccine threatened to become more a matter of political strategy than to safety, unfortunately, where politics, again, surpassed the science. At various times since launching the Operation Warp Speed, Trump forecast that the vaccine could be ready by October, before the election date, by the end of the year, and so on. But experts in public health said that, you know, these are unrealistic numbers. The government has approximately invested heavily in vaccine development, but this rhetoric has politicized the development process and unfortunately led to a growing public distrust. America's leaders had failed at almost every single step taking a crisis and turned into a tragedy. And now they're facing another one, which is the distribution of the vaccine. Now we have another phase. Recent evidence suggests that the majority of these cases could be avoidable. I mean, our families, mother, grandmothers, or loved ones could be saved even if the country had been prepared for the health crisis by now. But now that we are getting closer to having life-saving vaccines available, no one should not manage vaccine distribution and administration the way they have managed testing and treating before. No one should allow for unnecessary deaths. And the same for the USA as well. As well. The US isn't the only powerful country failing this test. So uh, to be honest, China's deny and obfuscate strategy at the outset helped speed the coronavirus spread at the first. Russia's official stance, it has uh, gotten COVID under control, belies its likely catastrophic death and case totals. Brazilian president's response, just like mirrored Trump's, with similar disastrous results, and India's poorly funded health system and widespread poverty mean that it is heading into a nightmare as well. These nations, not those in Europe, which had mounted a stunning turnout since March, are the company America keeps in pandemic infamy. While most Americans support common sense, disease fighting measures like masks and staying at home orders and so on, a substantial minority refuse these. I understand this, and this is all around the world, probably 50% of all the people. But the problem is less the actions of individual people than the federal leaders and in conjunction with science. So they have to listen to the scientists or their evidences to uh, take the steps. We are approaching this historic 100-year event with timidity and using politics to justify our inaction. If we continue on our current path, we face a very predictable outcome, and it's not good. USA is not the number one country with the COVID infections and deaths because the virus hits the, US, hits the USA. I mean, they're number one because we see that they're failing inepically because science and politics are right. just gotten together. Make no mistake, this is a war. It's war for all of us, but unlike some wars in which we can declare victory and get out, we have only two choices for this war. Aggressively face adversary or roll over and let approximately 3% of our population die. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Yerbeck. I appreciate your comments. Professor Kanat, if you can, if you can uh, go ahead, please, we'll take your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I tried to uh, keep it short. And uh, I tried to stick up with the uh, uh, with the title of the panel actually about American Dream. And when the idea of American Dream was offered, especially defined in 1930s, uh, an author called James T. Adams uh, described American Dream as uh, life should be better, richer, and fuller for everyone, right? And uh, with the same opportunities. 
And uh, if James T. Adams lived 2020, probably, he would call it an American nightmare, not an American dream. In this year only, United States lived the worst pandemic in the last 100 years since the Spanish flu, had the worst economic downturn since Great Depression, has the uh, biggest race riots and demonstrations since the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. So it was overall uh, one of the worst years probably in the US history and it was a nightmare. So what was the impact of COVID for the and cumulative effect of all these developments for the US for the US domestic politics and US global politics. I think uh, one of the most significant uh, dimension of it was uh, the polarization. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, we interviewed several policymakers in Washington DC and everybody was expecting to, uh, to have different, excuse me, uh, different outcomes for the uh, virus and the epidemic. Some people were telling that uh, it would be a transformative event for the world history and the United States. Some others were expecting that this will be just another crisis which would which we will overcome and uh, things would be much more much of the same again. But uh, what we have seen actually uh, with the pandemic for the last nine months uh, at least since March uh, 11 that uh, it basically accelerated the existing trends in the US politics and in international system. So number one, uh, there's a couple things I want to say shortly. Number one, the cultural uh, and social polarization in the United States. Uh, we knew that the polarization uh, is taking place. There was polarization about uh, in politics, in societal polarization was getting deeper about the gun control. It started with the Tea Party and then Trump's electoral uh, victory basically demonstrated how divided American society was. But we never think that an issue like pandemic, an issue like a mask can be an aspect of the cultural war between left and right, Democrats and Republicans. So we have seen the fragile state of United States, the society in the United States. Secondly, uh, especially this election actually demonstrated it one more time, although Biden won by 80 million, uh, it's all time high votes. Uh, Trump become the second uh, person, second uh, presidential candidate actually that won the most votes. Secondly, the uh, trust to Washington DC has never been lower, I guess. There has been this uh, debate all the time that there is not much trust to Washington establishment anymore, right? Uh, we started to see actually epidemic movies in 2000s that shows it is not the US presidents or the government authorities, but it is the World Health Organization that is saving the world, right? Movies like World War Z showed that, you know, like the US presidents, Washington was enabled, uh, basically unable to handle the crisis. And with this crisis itself, actually, the uh, trust to Washington establishment get lower and lower. And uh, thirdly, uh, we see the dysfunctionality in the United States, especially when it uh, is about the coordination between federal and state level authorities. The world basically watched almost two months, the president of the United States, the superpower of the world, and one of the biggest state in the United States, the governor of New York, discussing who should provide the masks. And this was, this was almost a dysfunctionality by itself. President was complaining about New York governor. New York governor was complaining about president, and they were complaining about who should provide N95 masks. And this actually demonstrated this. We have seen this actually in Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And we have witnessed this, how at that time FEMA failed actually, and how there was this debate between local and uh, federal governments about who should handle this crisis. Of course, this seriously impacted US image abroad as well. The recent Pew research demonstrates that among the 17 advanced economies around the world, these are OECD economies, right? Most of them are G20 members. US image has never been this low, right? The positive standing of the US has never been this low. So it seriously impacted the US credibility. 
in the United States and around the world, of course, it generated a new debate about globalization. So uh, in 2000s, you know, like until 9-11 probably, we have this globalization optimist who argue that it is the free flow of goods, services and ideas will have a transformative impact around the world. In 2001, we have seen that not only the good guys, bad guys can also be globalized. And in this pandemic, more than SARS, more than Ebola, more than Zika, for the first time, we have seen that the viruses, bacteria, microbes can be globalized as well. And suddenly we started to see this national close, uh, shutdowns, uh, closing of the uh, prohibiting international travels, etc. But at the same time, it generated a new debate about supply chains. So uh, is it, you know, like there was a psychological dimension of approaching globalization, but then economic dimension as well. There were almost a protectionism in medical uh, equipment uh, production. And we have seen this uh, conflict between European Union and United States about the 3M and its masks that were supposed to be sent to European countries from Philippines. We have seen about this debate about the ventilators. Suddenly we have seen medical equipment nationalism. And we always discuss economic nationalism and its impact on globalization, but we have never thought that medical equipments would be one of the sources of this. So it started a totally new debate. Then, of course, the international institutions. International institutions uh, had, a, at, at, at least at the beginning, had a very, you know, like the terrible test about the pandemic. World Health Organization statements in January, right? European Union's inability to help countries uh, in Europe, especially Italy and Spain. UN's uh, failure to basically come up with a solution demonstrated there is a grant for reform about these institutions. Yes, United States is planning to go back to World Health Organization. Yes, United Nations can be more effective in the future about this uh, issues like pandemics, but there is a fact over there that international institutions had a, not a very good record about the uh, handling of the pandemic. And finally, of course, American leadership. There is this paradoxical idea about American leadership People are upset when America showed too much leadership and people become more upset when um, there was a lack of leadership um, uh, from the U.S. to handle this crisis, right? We have seen this debate all the time that U.S. is, you know, like the trying to act like a world. Yes, that's true. But in the we kind of see that in the absence of the U.S. intervention about this pandemic, there wasn't anybody else who is willing to do that. And the lack of U.S. leadership generated a major problem about the pandemic actually now uh, we have seen that biden uh, president elect biden had this uh, i'm counting it 21 phone calls with the world leaders and the, the readouts there are two issues that is constant even with pope uh, he talked about these things right covid 19 crisis and climate change so is it something that united states is now reclaiming that trying to reclaim that leadership and would it have any consequences we have we have to see because we are talking about the first thing i mentioned was this divided american political system and polarized society and finally what is the american dream now so in 1931 james uh, t adams said it should be fuller uh, richer and you know like better life so what is the American dream now? I think the American dream now after this pandemic is something like what Winston Churchill said. It is like you can always count on the United States and Americans to do the right thing after they have tried everything else. So many people that is still optimistic about the United States is hoping that America did everything wrong about this crisis, right? From the very beginning to hide the information from the uh, uh, society then you know like the creating a cultural mask war then you know like the being late about you know like the certain things then the federal government and local government wars and with the vaccine and with the new administration can america do the right thing after it does everything wrong so if biden administration would achieve this, I think the new American dream would be, yes, we can do everything wrong, but at the, at the end, maybe we can, you know, like we can be the fixer of all of those things that we did wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kanat.
Uh, I appreciate those comments. Um, I'd like to kick off the discussion portion uh, with just some few, some quick uh, observations of mine that I had. Um, and just want to include one of the last things you, you were talking about. I think it's important to note about the American dream in general or the United States in general, that there is not one. I mean, there is a United States, but it's as good as saying there are 51 Americas. There are the 50 states, perhaps the District of Columbia, and then the federal government. Um, I experienced, I had an interesting experience in 2020. I was in Iceland and then the United Kingdom in February uh, and then Los Angeles in March uh, of this year. And I remember um, it, COVID was almost non-existent. No one cared about it in the United Kingdom in February. Um, in March, when I went to the, I think the first time I realized that there was a pandemic was I went to get Excedrin at a uh, local pharmacy, uh, over-the-counter medicine for a headache uh, in Los Angeles. And there was no medicine of any kind left. No Excedrin, no Robitussin, no allergy medicine. Um, and, I, and I asked the person, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, the, the virus. And I was like, no, I don't know. I've been traveling up for business for the last two weeks. So I have no idea what's going on. And that's when it hit me the first time I realized um, what was going on. I had a chance to go back to the United States in August and travel to several states, New York, California, Oregon, um, uh, Washington, and Alaska. And I saw the 50 states in front of me. Um, no one in Alaska was wearing a mask. And this is August I'm talking about. Uh, practically no one. And what Professor, to, to address what Professor Falk was talking about, the, the rate of death mortality for indigenous Alaskans, um, native Alaskans was eight times higher than white Alaskans. Um, similarly, blacks and Latinos were three times, two to three times more likely to die of COVID in New York than uh, white Americans. So um, I'm just the opposite as Professor Shepard. I'm not an immigrant uh, to the United States. I'm just the opposite of an immigrant to Turkey. Um, uh, so I lived in the United States for the first 30 years. And that's something that I've realized uh, the first time I, I came to a European country and asked for medicine at a pharmacy or went to the, to the hospital and didn't have to pay anything for it was a shock to me. I, I was shocked that that wasn't the case that you could, that healthcare was a human right almost uh, in many European uh, countries. So just quickly, some statistics and we'll start the discussion. 17% of US GDP is spent on healthcare. The next closest developed country spends nearly less than half of that, Switzerland and Germany. And these are countries with far older populations. 40% um, of US hospitals are on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association said last year, $1 trillion was wasted on unnecessary spending. That's not B with a billion, that's T with a trillion. Um, and President Trump himself said that hospitals were decimated uh, during the pandemic. We heard finally about progressives taking over the United States and the Democratic Party um, and the left, essentially. Uh, not even the most progressive U.S. politician uh, talked about government takeover of hospitals or of healthcare in general. It was just merely to pay for healthcare. So with these uh, few, just from observations that I had, I want to kick off the discussion um, and we can strict, stick with uh, whoever, we can stay with whoever would like to start off. Um, show of hand, I guess we can, we can start from there. Uh, who would like to go first and kick off our discussion section? Uh, I see David Alexander's uh, hand first and then Mr. Uh, Sampath and then I think it was Richard and, and Daria or Daria and Richard. So please, David, go ahead. I can't hear you though, David. Is is, is Mr. Uh, Walcott's uh, mic on? Hold on one second, Mr. Walcott. I, I can't hear you. Can everyone? Can anyone hear Mr. Walcott? No. No, we can't. Yeah, one second, Mr. Walcott. One second. One second. Will we turn on your mic? Sure. Sure. Yeah. There we go. We can hear you now. We can, we can, hear, you can now. hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. 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 Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, no problem. Go Can you for hear it. Me now? Yes, yes. Per per yes. Perfect, yes. perfect. Thank you, uh, 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 Taha, uh, Mr. Arbus. Um, uh, and again, I'm happy to, to, to again be here. Just to kick off a quick question, uh, building on what you just said. Um, now, you have an interesting story in that you grew up in the U.S. and left to Turkey. Uh, now, many have a story wherein they grew up in, I would say, emerging markets if, 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 or frontier markets and move to the U.S. Uh, and so what, what, what we're seeing now is where emerging markets have long been feeding the U.S. talent. 
I myself am, am, am Jamaican and American, and right now I find myself in Jamaica for, for several reasons. And many of such individuals have, have gone to the U.S. to pursue the American dream and end up facing a harsh reality uh, because of the overall increase in disparity, in social disparity, the lack of leadership, hostile economic structures and inadequate social nets, etc. This has led to or may lead to mass repatriation. And so my question is, um, and, and I would suppose, I suppose directed to Professor Falk and, and uh, Professor Shepard is, with the enabling effects of technology on economic productivity, compounded with the expected reverse brain drain, uh, to what extent do we expect there to be a delta in the economic output and therein economic standing between the US and emerging markets? Professor so, Falk. Professor Falk, you want to go first? Thank you, then. Shall Thank I? Uh, I think that's a very probing question that uh, really requires uh, reflection to give an adequate answer to. Uh, uh, I, I believe that it's that the threat to American economic promise and leadership comes less from emerging markets than from the feeling that China has captured the high ground when it comes to dynamic economic development. And that therefore the focus of uh, American uh, geopolitical ambition is somehow in thwarting the Chinese ascendancy. I think that will be the preoccupation in foreign policy during the Biden presidency, and it will uh, contribute to what you correctly pointed out, this sense that the American dream may lie in foregoing America and seeking repatriation or seeking to fulfill that dream elsewhere in the world. So, so uh, I, I think it's a great question and just a few instances of where we've already seen um, the effect occur, right? So if you take a look at, if, if you think about Silicon Valley success was primarily success of immigrants who came studied in the United States state and built businesses. If people are being educated in that way and returning home, the result is they're going to do something with the intellectual capital they bring with them. So, so think about what Singapore did, think about what China did, and actually think about what Toronto's done and sort of say, how do we replicate that around the world? Right? Which is essentially, um, there was a huge number of students who came studying in American universities. And by the way, there's lots of other countries that have equivalent quality universities, but, but state in American universities tried to get a start, didn't work, went back, or, or actually were brought back nationally because they were sponsored nationally, built their own local institutions. And now if you take a look at the University of Singapore, they are world-class and they are a massively successful country. You look at the institutions in China, they are massively successful um, and, and huge innovation. And you take a look at Toronto actually is out innovating Silicon Valley for the last two years in a row, right? And so, so I think the, the evidence is that that actually, if we could take the, the, the people in countries and have them come to wherever the best education can be, have them try to get a start, and if not, or even just go home directly, and then begin at home, I think what happens is you'll get local answers to local problems that will be really successful and will distribute wealth around the world. I think an important point in that is that capital has to follow that strategy, right? That if if we're going to have, imagine we get a huge number of kids come from Nigeria, go to Oxford and Cambridge, get educated, go back to Nigeria. We need capital to follow them and help them build the model. And, and we actually don't think that way right now. So I, I, it's a great question. I actually think it would be a great thing for the world for that to occur, frankly. I don't think it's a competitive question because as the world gets wealthier, everyone gets wealthier. And, and I'd love to see it happen. So I, I love the intent behind the question. Thank you, Dean Shepard. Uh, Professor Sampath, I think you had uh, raised your hand after uh, Mr. Walcott. So Professor Sampath, you can go ahead. Thank you, Taha. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yes. Yes. Great. Great. 
Well, I want to thank uh, I want to thank the speakers Richard Blair, Halit, and Killick for for their insights. This is really just more of an extended comment. I'll try to keep it brief because I know we have about thirty minutes left to build on what I thought was not addressed regarding some of the more unique facets of the paradoxes of American democracy. Because, uh, as all of our speakers indicated, there is this inertia of the Cold War. There's a heavy investment in everything else. When America, as Killick's brilliant uh, allusion to Churchill that they you know, take credit for the things that are bad and failed everything else until Americans can figure out how they failed. Maybe they would come around and do the right thing. But it's not just the federal or the state, the fact that we have this kind of unique system compared to parliamentary systems. There are Eastern democracies, there are Western liberal democracies. I'm, more, I'm talking more about the, the erosion of the social contract. And when I compare America's diversity, for example, which was brought up by many of our speakers, the disparities that we're talking about, the underlying chronic intergenerational structures of oppression that then impact health, especially in a crisis where some people are, are more, way more afflicted. Beneath the veneer of equal rights or constitutional you know, commitments to equality, there is this fundamental erosion in the social contract that I think for a philosopher, which is what I do, is much deeper than the, the question of, of variability, as, as Blair said about political states. I mean, whether it's a centralized state like China, or if you're looking at autocratic systems like Singapore, or if you're looking at, let's say, global south democracies like Brazil, I mean, there's an immense diversity in Brazil. There's no doubt about it. Not, they have their own issues currently, notwithstanding. My fear, and this is where I can wrap up my comment, and I'd love to hear how, how our panelists view this. What we haven't taken into account is if we're dealing with almost 20 years now of potential political paralysis every time we have an election, going back to Bush Gore perhaps going back to Nixon. And yet we're living in the time when we've been more diverse now than we've ever been. And the inequality and the stratified inequality in the system is the worst, the erosion of civil rights, for example. Uh, so when you think about in the future, this immense diversification, and you think of a lack of conscience basically baked into the social contract that let's say the Canadians or Western liberal democracies in, in continental Europe and Scandinavia have, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about this cataclysmic convergence in our institutions and our general political landscape to A, handle the diversity, to promote the equality, and B, uh, leverage what was always has been the, the genius of American enterprise and R&D in the 20th century, in any case, shifting, as Richard said, from the best in class military technologies to an advanced healthcare system. Um, and it took a political moment where universal health care emerged and could be under threat with the conservative court. So th the question is much more grave than it, is it the nature of American politics? Is it the paradoxes, as Kulik said, that uh, afflict America in so many different ways? Is I would like to ask the panelists, do you think there's an erosion of the social contract? And if I sound pessimistic or apocalyptic, is it irredeemable, meaning irreversible? Are we on some path towards you know, potential cataclysmic you know, or perpetual paralysis, because that's my fear. Can, can I respond? Yes, we would like um, the panel who wants, yeah, who wants to go first. So Dr. Sampath, I, I actually think you're at the heart of the most important question. And, and, and in some ways, I don't know that it's intentional, right? Um, so if you look at it, the way we've interpreted it essentially is that, um, by creating simple measures of success, GDP and shareholder value, what you're missing are measures of distribution and, um, and relative success, right? And, and when you pair that with the kind of unintended consequence of technology plus globalization, the result is actually massive uh, disparity in, in all sorts of measures, right? And, and it's just, it's a byproduct of those things. And, and you don't see it because when I'm measuring GDP and the country is getting 5%, 6%, 7%, 2.5% growth, it feels like the things are going okay, but I'm missing the, the, the huge disparity that's growing under it. And, and, and technology concentrates wealth, right? So the, the, you know, the first piece of work was done, and that's by a colleague of mine at Duke, which was actually technology is a winner-take-all kind of world, particularly platform technology, like how we're working over. And so it drives it. So to me, I think what we have to do is sort of say, what was good about the original premises that we took out of the Second World War? You know, globalization is largely good, technology is largely good, and simple measures of success are good, and then adapt them in a way that makes them more amenable. So 
yes, you need civil measures because without them you can't be strategic, but could we make them more inclusive and more interdependent, right? Yes, you need technology, but can we worry about the unintended consequences on humanity and human systems? Yes, globalization is good, but can we start focusing on thriving local economies first? And so we create a more complicated systems. My business school colleagues I used to have would hate teaching, but frankly, I think they're more adaptive to philosophy. And, and, and the reason it's that, that it's, if you think about the original work that started the whole premise of the economic model we have, he lived in Edinburgh where you didn't dare do something bad because you went to church on Sunday and you met them in the market and you interacted with them. And so there was an implied social good that came from economic growth because you had to do it. Now we have to sort of impose it otherwise. And if we could make that occur, I'm way more optimistic than you are. But if we don't make it occur, I think as the, the title of the book we just wrote is 10 Years to Midnight. I, it's pretty apocalyptic, I think, frankly. So, so I, I, I lodge your question. Can I jump in and say a few things? Thank you, Blair. More specifically uh, about the uh, United States, I guess. I see, you know, when I look at what is going on right now, I see a lot of parallels and similarities in 1920s. And uh, as you may recall, that roaring 20s, technological advancement, Henry, T Henry Ford's T model, you know, like the uh, Fleming is finding penicillin, you know, like the radio and everything. That advancement, that a ma major leap in economy generates its those who cannot have those lips and those who fall behind, right? 1920s are roaring 20s about everything. You know, when you look at the culture, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, you know, jazz age and everything. But it also generated foreign policy isolationism. It generated societal polarization, economic protectionism. It generated political populism. So uh, when we look at America first, that America first committees that Warren Harding and others started in 1920s. So when I look at today, I see that the unipolar moment of 1990s and that American hegemony of the first decade of 2000 generated those who are in a disadvantaged position. And America started to have this culture war later than a lot of advanced advanced democracies and a lot of actually emerging markets, right? In 1990s, when I was in Turkey, we had this argument that whether globalization is good or bad for the Turkish culture, right? Whether there would be ways to protect our national culture uh, because of globalization. And United States started to leave this debate after 2010. And we started to see that those who were left behind, those who we can call, you know, like what Trump used to call silent majority, using Nixon's term, basically is emerging and they are starting to react. And the, what we are witnessing is the same thing that we are witnessing in 1920s. There are those who want foreign policy isolations. You know, uh, what Biden's election, why it is for me, you know, like different than others for the last 30 years since 1992, whoever claimed expertise on foreign policy, expertise and experience in foreign policy lost elections in the U.S. Because American people do not care about it, right? Those, uh, the candidates that basically says, I don't care about foreign policy used to win the election. So now we are witnessing a breakthrough. So it is, I think it is a major uh, a critical juncture for the United States. The United States will decide whether it will go to 1930s, right? The racism, Ku Klux Klan of 1930s, rise of anti-Semitism and others, or United States will prefer to go back to 1950s. That it kind of, you know, like the revive the institutions that it created. So when Biden said America is back, I'm not sure which America is he talking about. Is he talking about 1990s America? Is he talking about Obama's America? Or is he talking about 1950s, right? He is definitely not talking about 1930s, that we know. But we are not sure which America will Biden pick and which America will Americans will prefer to follow at this point. Thank you, Can Professor Khan. Professor Falk, and then I'm going to go to uh, Professor Unutmaz after that. Professor Falk, please go ahead. 
and then we'll go to the other. We have three other questions. Yes, go ahead, uh, Professor Falk. Yeah. I, I wanted to respond uh, briefly to the very interesting focus on uh, whether the social contract is eroded or broken as a result of these developments. And one of the uh, features, I think, of how the U.S. is developing and was apparent in the outcome of the recent elections, which uh, had this uh, paradoxical result that Trump was defeated, but Trumpism basically was affirmed in the sense that the Republican Party uh, gained uh, in uh, congressional seats and on the federal state level. No blue uh, wave. So what, what I think what what I think, think is two visions of a uh, transformed social contract. The Trumpists want a social contract that emphasizes a minimalist governmental role and an America first vision of uh, uh, engaging the world, while the uh, Biden uh, uh, kind of vision is one of uh, restoring the bilateral, you know, transcending the polarization, which I think is a delusional objective. The polarization is deep and cannot be easily accommodated. And, and what B Biden is heading toward is another kind of uh, Cold War engagement with the world. That there is the adversary and there is the uh, Western uh, uh, commitment to uh, civility and uh, liberal ideals versus the authoritarian Chinese kind of model. I, so I think that, that as far as the social contract is concerned, there isn't a live option that looks to the positive uh, potentiality of a uh, moral globalization that uh, emphasized a, the promotion of the global public good uh, as part of realizing the national public good. There isn't that uh, sense of uh, what used to be called idealism, but in the current world context is really the new realism. The new realism is to become uh, a moral globalist. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Professor Falk. If there are no other, uh, I'm going to go to Professor Unutmaz and then Professor Sakwa, John, and then Kose in that order, if that's okay with you. Uh, I have, and then Professor Baba. Is that okay? Professor Unutmans, can we have your comments, please? Sure. Um, I think we would all agree that this COVID-19 pandemic was uh, really a tremendous uh, healthcare catastrophe for U.S. Uh, there's no question about that. But in hindsight, perhaps it really revealed the, uh, the weakness in, in healthcare in general in the U.S. Um, and that's probably another discussion. Uh, but I, I think it would be also unfair to look at U.S. from a singular lens because, as, as uh, pointed out, there are probably 50 different U.S.s. You know, on the one level, there's the federal uh, U.S., uh, and there's there's no question that uh, there were there were a lot of missteps there. Uh, but on a state level, you know, state by state, some states were uh, really uh, did a, a, a tremendous job in trying to um, uh, limit the um, at least the, the death toll and and, and the damage from from uh, from uh, uh, from the pandemic, uh, including New York and and for example Connecticut, where I am in Massachusetts, some of the New England states originally hit the hardest uh, and it w by by surprise at most. Uh, and even at, at an institutional level, many hospitals and many institutions um, they tried their best to to really um, uh, mobilize the uh, their testing capabilities and um, healthcare capabilities and so on. 
but my my bigger problem is is at the federal level, and as a scientist who have immigrated to U.S. a quarter century ago with with really an American dream, um, and and believing in in the institutions of of U.S. Uh, what was very concerning for for me and for many scientists in the U.S. was that during this period um, there was a really uh, a, a, a damage of trust on institutions. Uh, for example, CDC and FDA. These were uh, some of the most trusted institutions in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and and that that might be um, that might have a long lasting effect. Um, you know, I, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Professor Folk and, and uh, others, uh, you know, what what that means for um, scientific integrity uh, of U.S. Um, as well as the leadership of U.S. in, in, in medicine, technology and in science, uh, because I think, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the trust is easy to lose, but it's, it's much more difficult to gain. And that's that's really the most concerning aspect of all this. Uh, issues and I think um, uh, many things can be repaired, but can we actually repair the trust? Um, uh, not US, but uh, as a whole in the in the world um, to these institutions, uh, which 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 really uh, used to lead uh, in, in many aspects. That was great. Was that uh, anyone want to comment, or should we go to the next uh, commenter? Thank you for those comments, Professor Nutmans. Professor Sakwa, I think you were next. Thank you. I think it's important uh, to have this discussion. Uh, I was teaching this afternoon and I asked my students, uh, did they think that this pandemic uh, is going to change people's attitudes, the enormity and the scale of what happened? Uh, and yet the answer was universally that it didn't bring humanity together. It didn't heal societies in the face of a common adversity. It uh, Yes, there were some elements. The European Union a bit late has some plan now, though it's uh, having some difficulty getting it passed. We've talked a lot about institutions, but uh, what concerns me above all is the absence of new ideas. Uh, the uh, question about you know, we talked about the environmental crisis and other things. There's also the whole question of sustainability. There's the whole question in which we can embed all of that in a new type of peace order. We've mentioned the, uh, the idea of a second Cold War quite a lot. But that framework of this renewed confrontation in some ways emerges out of the very idea of the American dream, i.e. US exceptionalism, which has to, as our realist uh, IR scholars would say, um, has to achieve leadership primacy in the world. So I very much endorse what uh, Professor Falk said in terms of uh, the establishment of a new type of internationalism. But this requires a fundamental rethinking of the nature, if you like, the um, the complex in which US foreign policy takes place. From the outside, it's reasonably clear that the uh, Biden uh, victory means the restoration in some ways of precisely uh, new Cold War attitudes. It means competition. It means that the uh, US military um, uh, exercise in which nearly $800 billion a year are spent at a time when its infrastructure is crumbling, when, as we've seen, the shortfalls in the uh, hospital and other systems, not uh, to denigrate for a slightest, for a second, the commitment and the work which uh, healthcare workers have done, and indeed the good work of some of the states themselves. But ultimately, we are locked into a world in which the, what I call the second Cold War, which began some five years ago. Initially, it was focused on uh, Russia, US competition. It's now moved into a more um, intense uh, phase in which uh, Moscow and together in alignment. Uh, I mean, so look at it from outside. The US looks in a far more difficult, far more challenging position than some of the comments we've put here. I mean, it's not just a social contract. It means can the can those institutions, for example, even the way that Congress works, the committee system, which was reformed in the early 90s under Newt Gingrich when he after their victory in 1994, this really has 
created a logjam in which these institutions of US democracy in some ways, though it, it, I mean, in a sense, it survived the Trump episode, it, we hope. But ultimately, the, the bigger picture is that, uh, you know, when I'm saying these new ideas, which uh, have not been fed into the system. So we need to change institutions, but we need to change a philosophy. And indeed, from the outside, maybe some more modesty from the United States so that it can uh, focus on its own internal development. You know, that whole model of which I know that a lot of people in the US and indeed, I do believe that uh, there are sources of uh, generation, some of the younger Congress people who've been elected in the last few years are coming up with these some of these ideas, but it's not. We've got a system of intense polarization domestically and a system which generates conflict externally. And so I'm rather pessimistic about the way we can move forward. There are some ideas out there, but they're not gaining any major traction. And in the US, this intense polarization and segmentation uh, is going to endure. So uh, it's very difficult to see. And the Biden leadership in some ways will exacerbate all of this rather than provide any solution. Thank you, Professor Sakwa. I want to make sure we get to everyone. Professor John Kose, then Baba, please. Professor John, we can have your comments, please. Oh, hi. Uh, you, can you hear me? Yes, loud Hello? and clear. Yes. Oh, okay, so so yes. I think there is there is a, yes. there is a bit of lag. Um, I mean, I I would like to continue from uh, 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 Professor Unukma's points about the loss of trust, actually, and I think that. Loss of trust uh, is not, I mean, only to CDC or FDA, but generally there is a loss of trust uh, to the science, uh, scientists in general and the science in general. I mean, I believe uh, there is, uh, we, ha we, we, we scientists play a big role in it as well, because I think we also, some of us also politicize the science itself. You know, the, 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 the power, the knowledge of power, uh, sometimes by some scientists are used uh, to promote their own political agenda. I think uh, that is abusing uh, science itself. And and, uh, and <coughs> when that happens, uh, we, we see uh, loss of trust and, 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 and devastating consequences, like ha it happened in the US. Uh, like, I mean, we would see this kind of devastating consequences in polarized, politically polarized societies. I mean, I think there should be some self-reflection among scientists and, and maybe academic community in general that uh, are we using the, the strength of the science for uh, our political agenda and how um, honest we are actually. I think the other issue would be that many scientists relationship with the uh, with power uh, like industry uh, uh, also brings some uh, questions to the to the to the public's minds um, I think there has to there, there must be a more self-reflection self in the academic community thank you for those comments professor John professor Kusa please Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you. So if you look at uh, actually the current crisis, it's tested the resilience of the existing system. So we've been teaching about this global governance, possibilities of cooperation, institutions, collective values, liberal values that promote cooperation in times of crisis. So in many of our you know discussion, academic discussion, we constantly emphasize those elements uh, until now. But unfortunately, if you look at the, uh, the practical side of the story, uh, so uh, Kalich Kanat, for instance, uh, draw a picture from the US. And unfortunately, the situation in Europe is not better than the uh, US. So if you look at the situation in Spain, uh, if you look at the situation in Sweden, uh, in Italy, UK and France, uh, there is you know, devastating consequences, not in terms of the health situation, but at the same time, rise of the extreme right, uh, Islamophobia, uh, you know, xenophobia, 
uh, street protests, uh, yellow vests, and increasing radicalization of uh, politics, and as it's mentioned, uh, the decline of the social contract. So there are really ser serious consequences, and unfortunately, the liberal systems were unprepared. So although we have been discussing those, uh, you know, governance ideas, liberal ideas, but they were quite unprepared to uh, tackle this crisis. And some of the authoritarian or more, uh, you know, con centrally controlled uh, governments have tackled the crisis in a better way. So can we say that is this the end of the liberal system or is it going to prepare a new revision? Uh, because uh, what will happen in the aftermath of the crisis and who will help the recovery will take more important roles in the coming period. So can we say that uh, new ideology, new perspective uh, will emerge uh, as a leading ideology and uh, you know, new set of systems can emerge after this crisis? Or is it just uh, a failure of the system, liberal system, which may be recovered and uh, turned into a better situation after this? So uh, this is a major question. I mean, we still have this question. Unfortunately, so far, uh, the liberal uh, systems, Europe, uh, U.S. failed uh, behind uh, its promises in the economic and political field, and it gives really a uh, second thought on uh, alternative system, which so far performed uh, better despite their lack of transparency. So uh, this is also a question to Professor Falk and you know others. They have been thinking on those topics. So can there be an alternative as an outcome of this uh, crisis? If you'll permit me, um, we're going to add five minutes to the uh, conversation. I just want to go to Professor Baba first, and then Professor Falk, and then whoever else would like to um, add some uh, closing comments can do that, if that's okay with you, Professor Kutze. Is that okay? Sure. I, I guess so. So, Professor Baba, and then uh, we'll go around for uh, 30 seconds of, or a little bit longer, if need be, or as, I have time. It's 10 o'clock in, in, in Ankara. I'm not, I'm in no hurry, but uh, for to, to wrap up the conversation. So, Professor Baba, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. My question is about the point which Professor Kanata and Sakwa has been, they've been slightly touching the phone. I reckon the delusion of the American dream, which we all assume in this session, had another impact, which is more social, international, and maybe to an extent psychological, the soft power which has been a very significant component of American cumulative power. When we check a few statements of some leaders in these pandemic times, for example, the leader of Chechnya, Ramazan Kadrov, is saying that America has been maliciously violating ordinary citizen rights. North Korean newspapers objected to police brutality in America. Ayatollah Hamane said America has begun the process of its own destruction. And China's foreign ministry spokesman in one of the statements said, I can't read. So the emphasis of these very clear statements, which are obviously bolstered by politics of healthcare, its social implications, uprisings, racism, so on and so forth, have been denting the American soft power, at least for quite a few people overseas. Two countries that are first in law, very close allies of the US, Turkey and Australia, and presumably many more. Is there an official awareness towards this dance in Washington, D.C.? Do you think the forthcoming administration will basically dismiss them and let them heal themselves? We have, or they say, we have more serious stuff to worry about with their high level of global self-confidence. So which was actually that self-confidence was the inspiration of soft power, classical realism, and neorealism, or maybe as Professor Falk said, the new realism, or are they gonna take some measures to clear them out? Do you think with the end of this whole COVID pandemic, the US will be able to revert or downgrade the image of soft power? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bellas. We'll go to Professor Atach and then final comments from whoever wants to jump in. Professor Atach, would you like to add something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Professor Kutla Atach. I'm going to have some <laughs> emphasis on. Yeah. Please go ahead. I'm, I'm going to emphasize on one uh, um, problematic uh, situation that we are going to have in uh, American federal system is the intelligence community. Um, um, when we look at the uh, 
President Trump's decision-making process, we are going to have a very, very different um, uh, sphere of influence in the federal agencies in, 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 in a greater sense. Um, we have now, right now, uh, we all know that the problems is um, occurring uh, during the uh, late uh, 2015 and 16. And there are some uh, intelligence committees report that the pandemic, not the COVID-19, but the pandemic process has been approaching to the uh, in global level. And there's some uh, warning or red lights flashing in the Washington DC's uh, corridors in the, in, the, in the White House, as, as we see in uh, the President Obama's administration uh, establishments of uh, CDCs and the other uh, federal agencies. But uh, when we come to the, uh, the first year of President Trump's administration, he, he established some kind of negligence of federal agencies' warnings. And we came to the uh, 2020, and we know that uh, the, the federal system is trying to uh, recollect itself uh, to find its identity again uh, through the, the next administration of uh, Biden. But we are going to have some uh, great problem in the, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Shepard uh, emphasizes, design problem or leadership problem we are going to have in the, in the American system. Um, I wonder what will happen if we are going to uh, recap the, the administration in the next, uh, next years, in the coming years? So my question is to uh, Professor Shepard. Thank you, Professor Atat. To, to Dean Shepard, okay. Dean Shepard, and then anyone who wants to add some fining, final 30 second comments may do so, and then we'll, we'll begin to wrap up. So Dean Shepard, please, if you can address the last question. And the first question was, I see his hand as well. Uh, Dean Shepard, please. I don't think I can hear you though, Dean Shepard. Is your mic off or hold on one second while we address that? Oh, sorry, there were, there were one second, Dean Shepard. Several questions for Professor, several questions for Professor Fock. How about we let him go first and then um, and take the order we had? Because actually I think he had two or three questions that would be good for him to respond to. And I'm Happy to okay, follow we'll, we'll do it in order as you appear on the screen now. That's what we'll do. Okay. Professor Falk, please. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shepard. Uh, let me just make uh, three very quick points. I, I'm pessimistic in the short run for reasons that others have mentioned, but essentially because the polarization in the US is real and not easily reconcilable uh, uh, un until a new, uh, new kind of politics emerges, which I was identifying as a new realism. Without a new realism, this polarization will continue to paralyze uh, the American internal and international effectiveness and uh, contribution. So, and I think essential for that to happen is a demilitarization of the political imagination. The US has spends now more than the next 10 countries in the world uh, on uh, its military uh, entrepreneurial global role and has never been more insecure. Uh, there's a complete uh, mismatch between this overinvestment in military and its outcome. It's lost war after war since Vietnam against weaker opponents because wars are not won and lost uh, anymore on the military battlefield. They're as often lost on the political ballot battlefield by uh, supremacy in what, it, what people call soft power. So I do feel that a new realism is possible, but it will, ha it will have to come 
as a kind of progressive populism with demilitarization, a reallocation of resources, redesign of institutions, restoration of trust, and many of the things that the discussants have mentioned through the course of our roundtable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fall. Um, so, so again, three quick responses. Um, the, the first is I actually want to come back to the articulated concern about trust and institutions. Um, to me, I think there are two existential crises that that actually the U.S. and the world, the, the market-based system is actually ahead of the political system on this one. Actually, shareholders are beginning to demand a very different way to think about organizations. And, and as they're pushing a very different thing about organizations, they're saying, build us a sustainable forward-looking future, which is a kind of different fusion, Professor Kanat, of the American ideal that sort of allows sort of our, our effective uh, cohabitation with the environment we're part of, as well as effective cohabitation with other people around the world. And so I think in a way, the pragmatism of the market may actually force us to invent something well before the political debates get resolved, because I just don't see how they resolve themselves very easily. And, and again, I would point to, if you look at the, the amazing re reconfiguration of how we develop drugs, that's an example of what happens when we focus on a single problem singularly and put the most creative energy we have against it. So I think it's the extremity of the climate crisis and the ingenuity we have behind that that makes me optimistic we'll reinvent the system. Thank you, Dean Shepard. Dr. Yarabuckin? Well, any final thoughts? Just to say, uh, do, do, no, 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 do, there's nothing uh, to say. Uh, just to add a sentence, just like Paul, uh, Mr. Fox, he said, you know, demilitarize uh, because. Uh, America is insecure the greatest way that it hasn't been before. But it's the same thing happening in COVID-19 as well. They are, just like Trump said, uh, they were ready for anything. They were the number one, the, the best, but um, the, the last result. I hope uh, that they will uh, figure out a way and uh, to uh, overcome all these issues. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yerbaka. Professor Kanat, please. Uh, and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, I think among all of these debates about COVID-19 and its impact to United States and uh, the world, we have to remember that the crisis is still going on. So uh, as you may recall, in the 200-year uh, anniversary of French Revolution, is they ask a statesman, what do you think the impact of French Revolution was to the world history? And he said, it is too soon to tell. So we are in the midst of the uh, coronavirus pandemic and its economic, social and political aftershocks, I think will come through throughout not only 2021, but 2022, 2023. Even the, the reports in the Congress about the unemployment rate in the United States show that its impact may continue until 2030. And uh, yes, United States did uh, poorly in the crisis, but as I mentioned, uh, the Winston Churchill's idea of America, and if Biden is very serious about that, America may make a comeback. And I was looking at the numbers today, the businessman who increased its wealth uh, during the pandemic, right? The first five people was Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and or Warren Buffett. The same, you know, like the, uh, the same people that basically establishes the uh, uh, pillars of maybe the new American capitalism. So uh, I think, yes, there are problems, but uh, I think uh, it is too soon to tell that uh, COVID-19 pandemic transformed or changed things. As I mentioned, it expedited some trends and maybe it will be a wake up call for the politicians and those responsible parties to find a solution for those existing trends. It may be a wake up call at the end of the day, instead of being a, you know, like the reason for uh, the uh, American decline. Because whenever I hear this American decline word, I keep remembering 1960s, 1970s, 
when there was economic crisis, when there was Vietnam War, there was debate about American decline. In Reagan years, there was debate about American decline. And in 2000, there were flurry of books and articles saying that America is over. There were books called Post-American World. So I think it is too early to tell that, you know, like what is the real impact of uh, this pandemic to United States? Thank you very much. Thank you.